U.S. Census, Questions, Confidentiality, and the 72-Year Rule. My targeted audience are census researchers, genealogists, historians, students, etc. I have an article on the 72-year rule. There's a link there to it. I'll talk about that later. If you want to know more about me, I have a small little website. There is an address for that. This was recorded in late May of 2020. This is what I hope to accomplish. We're going to look at the growth of census questions. We're going to look at the right of refusal. Then we'll see uh, the confidentiality. When did that start, if ever? And then the 72 year privacy rule. The US Constitution states that there has to be a census, an enumeration taken in the United States. And the wording is that the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as they shall by law direct. And the first census was in 1790 and Congress determined what was in it, what sorts of questions would be in it. So the first census in 1790 doesn't have much information. Head of household name, number of people in the, in the household, uh, general era uh, counts of uh, males, females, uh, a little bit of age, and free people or slaves. And that's about it. And there was uh, a lot of discussion about whether they could ask other questions. James Madison was the person who was in charge. He really wanted to have an occupation question. People just said, no, you don't need that because in the summer you might have one job and in the winter you might have another. Uh, there was another sus uh, problem, a suspicion that they were very cl close after the Revolutionary War. They didn't want the government to be too, too intrusive. And the, the quote I saw, which I really like, was that the reason you don't have many questions is it would be useful only for, for idle people to make a book. Given that the U.S. Census is a, a crucial tool for genealogists, people in, uh, who are economics people, uh, sociologists, etc., uh, that sure didn't turn out to be correct. There was a slow growth of questions and schedules, like mortality schedule, population schedule. And in 1870, there were uh, a number, but in 1880, it just jumped. So in 1880, there were 215 schedules and over 13,000 inquiries. So what happened? Well, in 1880, there was a major revision of census law, a new bureaucracy. We didn't have assistant marshals doing it anymore. There were faster ways of um, summarizing the information with counting machines. And there was an increased interest in social sciences and concurrently with statistics. So if one looks at the uh, title of the 1890 census, one finds that it's not only population, but social statistics in this particular uh, schedule. Now, we don't have the 1890 census, unfortunately. It was stored in the um, Commerce Department building, and a fire of unknown cause broke out. The amount of water they pumped into that to stop it was pretty high soaked the 1890 census. They didn't have a way of, uh, of uh, conserving it, and it just rotted. And eventually, the determination was made to just take it to the local dump. It was not microfilmed. You can see that the questions were really personal. Uh, are you suffering from like, an acute or chronic disease? 
Uh, are you a convict, a prisoner, or a pauper? Uh, and there was quite, quite a pushback. In fact, this is a very famous uh, little drawing next uh, in Harper's Weekly that I have, Journal of Civilization. I like that. It's a, uh, uh, a two-page drawing. Let's see a better view of it. That's online. It's a woodcut. And so here is a census taker getting a reaction from the person he is enumerating. And you can guess what he's asking. He's saying, are you a pauper? And that person is livid, livid. Let's go to the next topic, the right of refusal. Do you have to answer the census question? Well, starting in the first census in 1790, uh, what this says is that, yes, anybody, uh, let's see, and, if, and be it further enacted that each and every person more than 16 years of age has to answer the questions. And if they did not respond, the census taker could sue them for $20 and the assistant marshal who was the taker split the money with the government. So he got $10. I'm not sure that's legal today. In 1880 and 1890, those 20 or older had to answer or be fined $100. And today, it's on, if people 18 years of, of age or older must answer or they can be fined no more than $100 or $500 for false answers. False answers is more of a sin than not answering. There was one census in 1890 that the census people told the public, you don't have to answer this question. And it was the 1890 census. And you can see the headline here is that patients' secrets are sacred, the superintendent forced to make the answers voluntary. So you could put down, um, uh, refuse to answer. I refuse to answer that, and it would be in the 1890 census. There were some economic questions also that you could refuse to answer. As I said, uh, not giving the correct answer, the true answer, uh, is more of a sin. And there's a great article in 1930 about this person who decided to take his absentee form. Um, he wasn't there when the census taker was there. And he filled it out and the census taker picked it up, looked at the answers and went to the authorities is what this person wrote on his census slip. Are you able to read and write, yes or no? How the heck do you think I could answer if I couldn't write? What is your mother tongue or native language? So-called English. In what year did you come first to the United States in 1897 in the front room. Are you naturalized or alien? Yes. Can you speak English? No. What is your trade profession or usual occupation? Uh, book legger. Then couldn't resist this added statement, written it down. I consider this questionnaire a great joke. Congress is bad enough. Why make it worse? Well, they arrested this guy. They arrested him. See census jester and first arrest here. And um, of course, the newspapers have had a field day on this. And the commissioner in the court when he glanced over the questionnaire and announced he would hold Robertson bail, said to the defendant, you aren't as funny as Will Roger and he gets paid for it. United States Attorney Tuttle, 
who also looked the questionnaire over said, I also have a sense of humor and I wanted the government to have the last laugh. Well, there's enough information here to track down this person's uh, census sheet. Name is Jason Roberts. He was arraigned on 19th April, 1930. And the schedule that has his name is dated the same day and there's none of the answers on his census slip. So he changed his mind pretty fast in the courtroom. And he is enumerated at the end of that particular district. Let's move on to confidentiality. Where's the promise that the census is confidential? The 1790 census was not confidential. In fact, the assistant marshal was required to post two public copies of the census uh, in, um, let's see, to be set up at two of the most public places within the same, there to remain for the inspection of all concerned, for each of which copies the said assistant shall be entitled to receive two dollars. And that procedure apparently happened through, through 1800 to 1840. What about 1850? Well, in 1850 to 1870, the original census form went to the county courthouse and you see a copy. When you do research on microfilm, you're looking at a copy and not looking at the original during these period of years. The instruction manual for census takers says that citizens, doubtless, doubtless, citizen access at the courthouse for personal application and suggesting any errors, no other use sanctioned. Now, as a side note, what happened to these originals? Well, I'll tell you that I know of two of them. Cecil DeMille was a famous movie director, and in June of 1915, he was filming in the San Fernando Valley. And there was an old house where trash was being burned. And so he went over there and he saw a thick pad of papers and he asked if he could have them and they, sure, it's just trash. And it turned out to be the Los Angeles City and County original 1850 census. Uh, so much for how they valued it and eventually got to the Southwest Museum. I have an original, a couple of original uh, sheets from 1850 and 1870. This is an 1870 mortality schedule. And I've only seen this once. This person said they got it from a, uh, um, a flea market and sold it on an auction site. It wasn't very expensive. No one really wondered whether it was original or not. And it really does look original. I compared it against the copy. There's more information here. And this is from East Boston. However, during this period of time, um, there were laws against the census takers. They weren't called enumerators, by the way. That term uh, originated in 1880. But these, these marshals, assistant marshals, uh, in, uh, were under legal obligation not to share the information. In 1850, they, they were told that you, you couldn't expose them without authority. You didn't have a right to, to tell other people except, you know, the, who needed to be told. In 1860, you were to consider the facts communicated as obtained exclusively for the use of the government and not in any way to be used for the gratification of curiosity or your private advantage or emolument use. 1880, you should not disclose any information obtained uh, to any person or persons except to your superior officers under penalty of disclosure with a fine of up to $500, which was hefty in 1880. The 1880 census schedule, those are the sheets, the schedule, the county had a copy 
and the original to the US, although it might be the copy that went to the US. So the count, there was still this idea that the census belonged to all of us. We could actually get to take a look at it. In 1890 to 1920, the counties uh, had an option to buy a copy of the census. And there's some rules about that. And I'll quote from it, upon the request of the governor or the chief officer of any municipal government, the director of the census shall furnish a copy of the names with the age, sex, color, or race and birthplace only of all persons enumerated within their jurisdiction. So this isn't a complete copy. It was enough uh, to uh, give you information about a person but not some of the other questions that were asked. So where is the promise of confidentiality? Well, there was a hearing in 1973 and they brought in some uh, historians and Professor Bogue was asked this question. Would we be breaking faith with the American public for the past censuses we have taken, if we opened those records to the general public or opened it for specific purposes. And he hedges on his answer, but he says this. He says, well, it is unclear in my mind, sir, as to exactly where and when the specific pledge entered. I do not find it in 1900. Now remember that, that's the 1900 census. We're going to find there was, there was a controversy about its release, but this person doesn't think there was any um, confidentiality of 1900. I do not believe it is in 1910, but I believe that something of this sort does enter in. So it's ambiguous. It's ambiguous. However, there was also a number of presidential proclamations that started. I know this is from Taft. Um, and the president issues this and says, hey, the census won't harm you. Don't worry about the answers you give. And they generally look like this. The proclamation is that the census has nothing to do with taxation, with army or jury service, with the compulsion of school attendance, with the regulation of immigration, with the enforcement of any national, state, or local law or ordinance, nor can, can any person be harmed in any way by furnishing the information required. There need be no fear that any disclosure will be made regarding any individual person's furnishing information. And the history of that actually is pretty checkered. In 1917, the census director released 1910 census transcripts. They were probably just names and ages and sex of the individual to the Department of Justice and to local draft boards to catch draft evaders. In 1940, um, um, the, there was a Japanese internment program instituted, a shameful program where 120,000 Japanese Americans were relocated from so-called security areas and many put in guarded camps during the war. In 1981, according to this article, the Bureau admitted giving other agencies data on Japanese Americans in such small areas as individual blocks. So they didn't release names, but they showed the location of these groups of Americans. There is a confidential, confidentiality exception that the Census Bureau itself has. And in 1903, they set up what's called an age search. Uh, people who didn't have their uh, birth certificates used the census to show how old they were. My own dad, a dozen didn't have a birth certificate. I was really surprised. He probably used the census. And in 19, 
09 and only brought in $32. However, um, during the 19, early 1910s, there was a, a Civil War pension law and people had to prove their age and the request exploded. In the 1930s, when Social Security came online, again, people had to show uh, proof of birth and the census and this age search was involved in that. In fact, the, this, for those of you who remember Soundexing uh, going into uh, indexes, that was Soundex, that was the main reason for the Soundexing of those censuses, which was the Social Security Act. In the 1940s, in order for you to work in a war plant, you needed to be a U.S. citizen. And that requirement also spurred uh, quite a number of requests for uh, age searching. And today, today, they don't get as many searches. They get about 7,200 a year. But it was an important feature. There's a website that tells you about it. Age Search Service. There are specific requirements and you can't you can't be anybody. You have to uh, have a legal reason for it. Uh, you have to uh, uh, be a blood relative, parent, child, brother, sister, grand, grandparent, the surviving wife or husband. You can see I'm reading this from the bottom. An administrator, an executive of an estate, uh, beneficiary by will or insurance. And it costs $65. And this is what one of them looks like. This has a 1944 date. I, I uh, bought this online. Didn't know who these people were. It turns out that the Fords were uh, a family of actors. And Max Ford wanted to know, uh, he, he wanted to see some certification on the census of his age at various times. Now, one of the censuses he asked for, and that was the census of 1900, taken as of June 1st. Now, we'll do a little aside on this. Uh, the top says that the following information, including spelling of name, relationship, age, etc., is an exact copy of the census record and cannot now be changed even though it may not agree with the applicant's statement. You can see that what they did was they only showed Max's line. And there's an asterisk there. The person doing this knew, knew that there was a problem. And so he emphasizes that, that that was as reported to the Census Bureau, because that's wrong, just on his face. So there is the disclaimer. And the fact, oh, it's a little bit off center, that this is 1900 and of June 1st. If, he, if Max was born on September 1883, and this was taken as of June 1st, 1900, how old is he? He's not 17. He is 16. He hasn't reached his 17th birthday yet. If you look at the actual census sheet, which of course he didn't have at the time um, because of the, of the rules, the 72 year rule, you'll see that on Max's line on the bottom, um, the 17 is crossed off and another number is put there. So somebody at the Census Bureau knew, knew that that was wrong, but they reported the wrong number. Now what's even crazier about this record is Max's sister, Dora. According to this, she was born October, the next month, 1883, in a different state. This was a very, very difficult pregnancy, obviously. Very difficult birth. Well, the whole thing is, is messed up. Uh, in fact, I think Max, uh, his birthday is 1884. Uh, or 1882, I found uh, uh, information 
about him when he went to get a passport. But that 1883 date is not correct. That's a caveat. Be careful with census uh, entries. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of possibilities here. Um, but according to this, both Max and Dora had the same parents. That's where the parents are born. Kentucky, Massachusetts. So let's look at the 72 year rule. I have written a paper on this in 2008, and it's available to you on the Steve Morse One Step website. Uh, that's a well-known website. There's a section on Ellis Island. There's a section on U.S. Census. And on the first part of the U.S. Census, there is the link to the 70 to the 72 year rule for U.S. Census. So we put that article on there. If you if you go to this website at stevemorse.org, make sure it's .org because .com is a professional musician. There's the article. So these are the important dates that we're going to look at. The National Archives was established in 1934. The precedent for 72 years was set in 1942. The precedent was formalized in 1952. And the precedent was codified, put as part of the law in 1978. Let's see what happened. And this has nothing to do with life expectancy. I base it on uh, a extensive search for information for congressional hearings, two congressional reports, and what's on the National Archives website. In 1902, the Bureau of the Census was uh, formalized in the Department of Commerce. Before that, every time there was a U.S. Census, they started anew, creating the staff. But here in 1902, we have a, a, a bureau that exists every year since. Their, their goal is to honor privacy and protect confidentiality on a privacy, protect confidentiality. The National Archives was established in 1934 to acquire, preserve, and make available records of the United States. Pretty much directly opposite, right, of what the Census Bureau is going to do. They want to be as transparent as possible. And in 1935, the Archives Building opened in Washington, D.C., very pretty structure. In 1949, the National Archives was transferred to the GSA. The General Services Administration is basically uh, an organization dealing with property. Not quite clear why the National Archives went there. But finally, in 1984, uh, it was announced they would become an independent agency, effective 1985. So the National Archives has two birth dates. Two birth dates. On its uh, logo or its, its shield, it has 1985, because that's when it became a separate administration. But when I was a, um, a volunteer at the Southern California uh, National Archive. The, they celebrated their 75th anniversary there, and I posed before it, and the, they started in 1934. So that's the difference. So some of the things I'm going to be telling you actually occurred uh, with, when the GSA was the lead person on these discussions. 
And the first few years were spent in trying to figure out what's out there to evaluate what needs to be saved and be put in before the public to get them into the National Archive away from existing agencies and to make them available to the public. Now, a statement of James O'Neill, and we will quote a lot from this in a congressional hearing uh, in November 1975, is very specific. It's really a good little um, hearing and a statement by James O'Neill. He says that shortly after the National Archives was established and population schedules transferred to the archives, the director of the Bureau of the Census and the archivist in the United States agreed, so there's agreement, that early population census schedule 1790 to 1870 would be open to all researchers immediately. The 1870 census records were made available to the archives in 1942, 72 years after the census was taken. This established the 72 year precedent for restrictions on population census records. Nothing to do with life expectancy. And remember, 1870, there was no confidentiality. Let me give you another opinion. J. Solomon, this must be a wise person. Joel, that's even better, Joel Solomon. There he is, head of the GSA before Congress in 1977, telling them the origin of the 72 year rule. Aha. And quote, traditionally, tradition, census records have been closed for research for a period of 72 years. And I could only find those two statements on the origin of 72 years for the confidentiality period. So in 1942, the 1870 records went to the National Archives. And 72 years later, they were released to the public. Now, in 1950, Congress imposed a 50-year privacy period on federal records unless the archivists of the U.S. set a longer time. And James O'Neill says, a few years later, the Bureau of the Census requested that certain original schedules remain closed because the paper had become brittle and there was danger that public handling would damage the records beyond repair. As a result, a microfilm project to film the returns by 1880 was undertaken. In 1952, remember this is 10 years after 1942, after the microfilm project had been completed and copies certified as adequate substitutes for the original schedules, and that's a decision that a lot of genealogists regret because microfilming technology wasn't that great. I mean, we would have done a much better job today. And a lot of those copies, those, those uh, microfilms are really, really difficult to read. It was decided to offer the original schedules and to negotiate an agreement on access to all subsequent population censuses. 1952. So there was an exchange of correspondence between the director of the Bureau of the Census and the archivist of the United States, so important that those letters are up at the National Archives website. Now, I'm not going to go into detail with you the outcome of them. So Roy Peel, the director of the census, sent a letter with uh, specifics this is what I want you to do on August 26, 1952. And 
Wayne Grover, the archivist, doesn't even have a letterhead stationery, returned and said, uh, we agree with these uh, terms. And so restrictions were put in place. There is that age search only for those directly involved. So that is confidential. But after 72 years, qualified, qualified researchers could look at the census, not everybody. And eventually, and it's unclear when that will happen, the National Archives would open it up to everybody. So, 1880 comes across. Released to the public after 72 years. Now, the 1890 census is only fragments. So, it's not a big deal about releasing just fragments of this destroyed census. Another 72 years. So, we have three times in a row that censuses were released. In 1972, you would the, the National Archives had 1900 to 1950 censuses. They were attempting to release the 1900 census, and the Census Bureau said no. Um, we don't want that to, to happen. They objected on the basis of confidentiality. And remember, the 1900 census, according to the historian, uh, had no indication of confidentiality. One of the problems is that they were running the 1970 census. There's nothing in it that indicates that your answers are going to be public. Your answers are confidential, only used for statistical purposes. It cannot by law be disclosed to any person outside the Census Bureau for any reason whatsoever. So let's continue. James O'Neill. In 1970, the Bureau of the Census, under criticism as it prepared to take the decennial census, requested that the 1900 individual returns not be released until at least the year 2000, 100 years. The National Archives and Records Service disagreed. Negotiations on the issue were inconclusive, i.e. no one uh, uh, wanted to change their view. And in 1972, at the request of the Department of Commerce, we, the National Archives, we agreed to delay the opening of the census records, which was scheduled for release on June 1st, pending further efforts to resolve the issue. During this period, both agencies requested a legal opinion from the Department of Justice to settle the question. In the Department of Justice opinion dated in 1973, the question was resolved. The authority of the Administrator of General Services, remember that's where the archives is, based upon the Federal Records Act to open the 1900 census records to researchers was affirmed. And they were released in 19. As a result of this ruling, the National Archives and Records Service and the Bureau of the Census worked out access procedures. I'm going to show you these. You won't believe them. To the Bureau's concerns. And in late 1973, the 1900 population census records were opened. So these are the stipulations. Who could access these films? Only historical, biographical, genealogical, or legal researchers could view the films. You had to prove that. There was some adjustment of the rules in 1975. Where were the films? They were only in Washington, D.C. No films could be bought by libraries or individuals. Uh, in 1975, the uh, branches, the National Archive branches, could have the films. How many roles could you see? One at a time, under supervision. Someone was watching you. At least in 1975, they gave you a limited number 
of roles. Still, someone was watching you. How many copies could you make? You couldn't make any copies in 1973. Because if you made a copy, you see, of the person you were looking at, the person who above you, you would violate the confidentiality. And in 1975, it was amended that copies only that related to your authorized, authorized research. What could you disclose? In 1973, you must not disclose information harmful to individuals or their heirs under the threat of criminal prosecution. It changed a little bit in 1975. You must not invade the privacy of living individuals under penalty of losing your archives access privileges. Could you request it by mail? No, it doesn't look like that's possible. Although in 75, um, maybe. So why do we get why do we get to see the 1900 census or any of the others? Um, why do we get to see the 1950 census when it comes out on April 1st, 2022? Well, there's a huge number of complaints, as you can imagine, a huge staff burden at the archives. And in the fall of 1977, the National Archives unilaterally, unilaterally proposed a rule change to eliminate all access restrictions. The archivist was James Rhodes. You owe it to this person. He put this rule on, into the Federal Register, which is what you do, asks for comments. Got 700 letters plus postcards. During the 30-day response period, not a single one was opposed to the proposed rule change, and all were in support. So he changed the rule. Again, in the Federal Register, saying, hey, you know, I'm going to open this up to everybody. And he says the experience of the National Archives staff since 1973 indicates that the confidentiality restrictions are no longer necessary. Well, the Census Bureau fought back. Uh, during this period of time, they had supported, during the 70s, they had supported a bill to close public access to the remaining population censuses. Didn't go anywhere. They opposed bills to open the census after 50 or 70 years, a legal uh, set in stone. In 1976, the census director testified before Congress, very unhappy, obviously, as you will see. Here's his statement. Well, under the agreement, the 1952 agreement that exists, which the Attorney General said was valid. The archivist has the authority to release the information after 72 years. We think if that agreement had not been in existence and anybody tried to get agreements like that today, they would not even have a chance to have a conversation about it. We think that agreement should be abrogated as well. It was finally resolved by changing the law, public law, it becomes a chapter uh, in uh, Title 44. However, there was a report on the bill that included the following. I want you to be clear about this. Furthermore, every American should receive assurances that the information provided will be held in the strictest confidence for their lifetime. The committee therefore strongly urges the Bureau of the Census and the Archivist together to maximize the confidentiality of census data during the lifetime of the responding American citizen and to consider extending the period of confidentiality beyond the present 72 years. Now we could spend some time discussing on the left the reasons why the census should be kept confidential. And we could be spending a lot of time on the right 
arguing why precedents were set and people didn't object and it should be open. But there were two more, three more things that tipped the back of the scale. The first was that our president during this time was a practicing genealogist. What a surprise, President Jimmy Carter. During the latter part of the debate, the House Speaker was Carl Albert from Oklahoma. You know what he did after he got out of the House in Oklahoma? He started a genealogy society and was their first president. And then the gorilla in this, the elephant in the corner, was Roots in 1976, where all of a sudden everybody became interested in doing genealogy. And as a result of that, I think it tipped the balance. So it becomes part of a public law. It's on the National Archives website. I want to show you this. I'm going to read this. It's in 44 USC chapter two. And uh, number 2108, responsibility for custody, use and withdrawal of records. It's uh, item B. Not a single mention of 72 years. Yeah. With regard to the census and survey records of the Bureau of the Census, containing data identifying individuals enumerated in population censuses, any release pursuant to this section of such identifying information contained in such records shall be made by the archivist pursuant to the specifications and agreements set forth in the exchange of correspondence on or about the date of October 10th, 1952. Between the director of the Bureau of the Census and the archivist of the United States, together with all amendments thereto now or hereafter entered between the director of the Bureau of the Census and the Archivist of the United States. Such amendments, if any, shall be published in the register. If those two people can agree on a different length of confidentiality, they could do it. So the, 18, the 1980 census of the United States had a paragraph now that said the law under which the census is taken protects the confidentiality of your answers. However, for the next 272 years or until April 1st, 2052, only sworn census workers have access to the individual records and no one else may see them for the next 72 years. But after that, uh, they need to, I mean, they don't state it specifically, uh, it's obvious it will become public. 2010. Your answers, let's see, as allowed by law, your census data becomes public after 72 years. In the 2020 census that we're taking right now, it says to support historical research, Title 44 of the U.S. Code, that's what USC stands for, allows the National Archives and Records Administration, their full title, to release census records only after 72 years. I want to acknowledge the people who helped me with my original paper in 2008. Paul Wamser of the National Archives, then at Laguna Niguel. Barbara Victorino at the Washington, D.C. National Archives. My reference libraries at my home institute, institution at California State University at Fullerton and the Roots Key Editorial Board. So I hope you enjoyed that. This is another JDW talk. I now have four up. Eventually I will have six talks on the U.S. Census and the censuses of New York City. Um, I ha will have some talks up on Ellis Island and also have talks up now on um, A.L. Human, he was a naturalist, and a, a virtual field trip uh, to the headlands of Orange County. So, 
If you like this, uh, please spread the word. Thank you.